This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amaretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewers' natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. Well, it's a Tuesday night, and here we are again. Uh, this is the Mead House, and uh, we've got, gosh, we've got so much to talk about. This might even turn into another one of those lengthy shows, but uh, what the heck. Uh, I'm joined at the table tonight by Aaron Martin, Mississippi Chris Spencer, uh, Jeff Schaus in the house, and, of course, my name is J.D. Webb. This is a show uh, for the home mead maker. Uh, you know, if you're into making good meads at home, let us throw the honey out for you. Uh, we've already put down one recipe. Uh, we're going to be working on a second tonight. It's a cherry mead. Uh, we'll get into that here in just a little while. Uh, TheMeadHouse.com, that's where we live. Everything you need to know about The Mead House is right there. Uh, we put up a few recipes now and again that we come across uh, out of our own repertoire that we feel that uh, is okay or at least good enough to put our name on it and let other people uh, have at it. Um, we do have a Facebook. Uh, it's just simply The Mead House. Uh, just go to Facebook and up in that little search deal thingy window at the top, just put The Mead House, uh, and it'll come right up. Uh, we don't do the Twitter thing, sorry. Uh, although I have to, you know, I need to, I need to, well, we, we kind of do the Twitter and we kind of don't. Uh, the, the website, every time we make a post on a website, it automatically sends this deal out to Twitter. I have no idea what it looks like because, frankly, I really don't tweet. So if you're getting the thing on a Twitter, cool. If not, oh, well. <laughs> so we do have a uh, call-in number, 818-921-4680. If you happen to be listening live, feel free. Give us a call. We'll be glad to talk to you about anything related to mead. Um we're going to go through the what we're drinking here in just a minute. But uh, first, guys, I want to throw a shout-out to Sergio Mutella uh, out there in uh, in New Jersey, Melovino uh, Meadery in New Jersey, Vauxhall, New Jersey, to be exact, if we can throw a shameless plug out there for him. Um, Sergio was kind enough to send us not one, not two, not even three, but five bottles of mead uh, to each one of us here on the show. And, uh, Sergio, a million thanks from uh, the boys and I here at the Mead House. We really appreciate it. Um, I, you know, we've been talking about it off and on. Uh, we've been trying them out. And I'll lead this one off, guys. I'm actually drinking one of Sergio's meads tonight. It's the All Night Long. I purposely saved it for tonight because we're going to spend uh, at least a few minutes kind of updating, going through the coffee thing, since that's our big project for the month. Um, I, I, you know, it's good. I, I like this. I'm, I'm hoping that the coffee project that we've got going is going to head in this direction. Um a little on the sweet side for my own palate, but I do enjoy the the coffee flavor. I'm really loving that. Uh, just a tad more, and I'll tell you, I could just put a straw in the bottle and drink it just like that. So, uh, Chris, uh, what's in your cup tonight, bud? Well, I've actually got the uh, all night long, and I've got two glasses. I've got... Uh all night long, and I've got the Attempted to Touch, which is a chocolate vanilla mead. Uh, both of them are, are great meads. The uh, the coffee really comes through. Um, I, I'm with you on the sweetness. I think I would probably go a little less sweet on the coffee. Um, this uh, The chocolate vanilla is a really good mead. Uh, attempted to Touch 
for those of you that go to Sergio's website or can find them in a store somewhere. Uh, you know, I want to bring up a point about these two needs here because these are these are primarily traditional needs with with just some some light flavorings in them. And uh, aside from the coffee and the chocolate and the vanilla, uh, I think it's important to point out just how good the base need in all this is. Uh, if you're looking, if you want to see a good example of a traditional honey need, uh, get either one of these and see if you can ignore the uh, the adjunct flavors and just pay attention to how good the traditional need in this is, how clean and smooth and the alcohol is just not even there. Um, that, that's the way to make need. Yeah, high five on that for sure. And uh, Aaron, uh, what are you drinking tonight? Well, let's make it three for three here. I've also got the last little bit of the all night long here that I opened up over the weekend. And and I'll tell you, it's been really difficult to save this last glass for tonight. Um, Just definitely want to echo everything that, that you guys said about this. The other thing I will mention is that my wife does not like mead. You know, I, I've made several batches of, of my own. I, I'm always going out and buying different batches as well or, per, you know, commercial meads and just, you know, bat, batch after batch, mead after mead. She she just is not a fan. And this is one, I don't know if it was the coffee flavor or, Chris, like you were saying, just the the clean fermentation where it's just a really good base mead behind it. She liked this. Um, so, Tip of the cap to Sergio, and, and thank you very much for sending these. Definitely enjoyed enjoying them. Guess, guess what kind of mead that Aaron's going to be making from now on. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this one-gallon uh, test batch here, this this may turn into a, a larger-scale production here. <laughs> <laughs> there, you, there you go. Jeff, uh, what's in your glass tonight, partner? Well, I've got two meads as well, and uh, I'm I'm the combo breaker here. I am not drinking the coffee mead. I thought it was a really good mead. You know, I'm I'm gonna echo uh, you and uh, Chris here on this one. Uh, a little sweet for my taste, maybe like a little bit more coffee flavor, but it was a really good mead altogether. Um, the two I'm drinking tonight are the Midnight Jack, which was um, really interesting. It's four black fruits: uh, black cherry, black currant, uh, black raspberry, and one other, I get that. Blackberry. Blackberry, Blackberry, of course, the obvious one. Thank mm-hmm. you. Um, and it's a really delightful little drink. Um, very tart without being too sweet. Um, got a lot of uh, body and a lot of, of interesting things going on with it. Um, I've, I've kind of been, it's got so much body that I don't exactly want to drink a big glass of it at once, but I've been kind of like every time I walk into the kitchen, this this weekend and yeah, yesterday, it's been like, hmm, do I want another sip? Yeah, I want another sip. I just keep coming back for more and like getting this uh, all the the interesting flavors going on together with this one. It's been really enjoyable for me. You know, I've had uh, I've had a sip of all five, and I do have two bottles sitting here on my desk tonight. The other one, of course, is the tempted to touch as well. I'm with I'm with Chris on that one. Um, I I, I kind of like the flavor of it, although I, I'm not sure. You know, I, don't, I always get this coffee-like flavor. Now, I, I've never chewed on or sucked on or tasted a cocoa nib. Uh, I don't know if it's supposed to taste like chocolate or not, but it's got a pretty good little flavor that I, I, I'm kind of enjoying. Uh, and, again, that's that, that's that tempted to touch, and I'll have a little bit more of it here as the show goes on. Um, I like that kind of thing in a mead where you you taste it and you you really get something interesting and it makes you go, hmm, what is that? Yeah, what is that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I like that. But Jeff, what was the other one you're drinking besides Midnight Jack? The other one I got is the the Garrido. It's the Piment from Portuguese Grapes, and this is uh, this is actually of the ones we tried. This was my wife's favorite. It's um, it's really kind of our speed. It's dry without a lot of uh, the astringency that kind of puckers your mouth. Uh, really nice, really light and enjoyable. I mean, I could see on a hot day like today just hanging out and 
uh, sitting in the shade with a, a tall glass of this and really enjoying myself. Um, this is also the first piment I've ever really tried that was like a straight piment and not like some kind of experimental treatment after the fact too. So um, it's a nice way to broaden my horizons a little too. <laughs> is that the uh, that's the one with the Portuguese yeast, right? Uh, Portuguese grapes, yes. Yeah, inter- yeah, and grape, yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, I did. Uh, I remember tasting. Uh, a ver- I had a very slow grape uh, taste to it, and uh, I don't know anything about Portuguese yeast, so I, I, I don't know what contributions it would have made. I need to look that one up or ask Sergio uh, uh, about that Portuguese yeast a little bit. Um, and again, Sergio. Gosh, man, thanks a million for uh, for sending this out. And, and I'll tell you, the one thing, uh, them, uh, gosh, the the one with the blackberries. What's the name of that one again? <laughs> Midnight Jack. Uh, Jack. Don't, yeah, don't get old. Uh, yeah, the Midnight Jack. Um, I I I got to get that into a saucepan and reduce it down, and maybe toss a little red wine in along with it. And make some kind of a glaze to go over a pork roast. That that was what I was thinking when I first tasted that. Uh, you know, to reduce it down and make some kind of a glaze out of it. Uh, you know, sitting there my first that, thought, watering already. Yeah, my my first thought on that one was a piece of New York cheesecake. There you go. Yeah, or even uh, yeah. Re- reduce it down. Uh, add a little bit more honey to it, and then drizzle it over some cheesecake. There you go. Sergio, are you paying attention? <laughs> so so at the tasting room, Sergio, when we come out there to New Jersey, a uh, piece of cheesecake with uh, some of that reduction drizzled over the top. What do you say? <laughs> yeah, is that, is that the uh, 2017 Meat House Tour? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the, yeah, the 2017 Meat House Tour. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, again, uh, welcome, folks, uh, to the Mead House. A uh, couple of shout-outs I want to get started, and uh, we're going to have a brief discussion on one of them, guys. Uh, Mark Price on uh, the Mead Facebook page, uh, he's got a question here. Anyone encounter a mead getting darker after fermentation stopped? It's been done for about a month. Seems like it's gone from cleared cider color to about an amber ale. Uh, he doesn't think it's oxidization or oxidation, rather, uh, as it's been in a completely sealed container for aging, but it could very well be due to off gassing too much. It's, you know, first of all, it's, it's sometimes hard to tell, guys, when you put. Uh, on any one of the Facebook meat groups out there, uh, a good thing, a good practice to get into is put the full recipe up there so that we can see exactly what you put into it. Because the hard part is trying to guess uh, at a decent answer, or at least one that sounds reasonable, um, you know, without knowing uh, any of that. But guys, do you have uh, do you have any idea what would make a mead go darker? During aging, apple juice. Apple juice. Apple juice. Uh, almost every sizer that I've ever made has gotten darker, um, and especially if it's sitting where sunlight can get to it. Sunlight, yeah. So that'll, I, that'll do it. Yeah, I, I don't know what he had. Uh, I don't know what kind of uh, a, a mead this is. I don't know whether it's. Uh, I'm, I'm going to assume it's a traditional. He's talking about it going from cider color to an amber ale color. Uh, although, I mean, it could be anything at this point. But uh, Jeff, Aaron, any ideas? Well, yeah, I think sunlight is definitely a, a possibility. I mean, it sounds like if he. Uh if he can tell the, the color shade difference between a cider and a light amber, um, he's got it in a clear glass bottle, and it may be out in uh, a place that's exposed to light, so that might be playing a factor in it. Um, beyond that, I'm, I'm honestly not certain as to uh, to what could be causing it. No, and, and I was going to say, in my experiences, I've just had the opposite happen, where you'll mix up a batch and the must is a darker color than 
what it looks like once it's fermented. So, so that's a new one for me. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, the only thing I can come up with, uh, you know, is the sunlight aspect. Uh, you know, if it's left uncovered, or maybe it was covered and then uncovered, or it started out covered and then was uncovered, either way, that might have some kind of an impact on it. But I have read where uh, exposed, uh, you know, carboys, uh, especially in a direct sunlight, uh, it caused the mead to change colors. Uh, and will sometimes even alter the, go as far as altering the taste too. So, um, I don't know, you know, what is it, osmosis or whatever takes place because of the sunlight. I have no clue. I'm not a scientist, but, uh, everything that I've read, uh, uh, kind of leads me that direction. But, uh, Mark Price, uh, I, you know, I, I hope we were to a, able to help you out there a little bit. Um, you know, uh, and uh, maybe the guys on uh, on the Facebook page, uh, uh, you know, can help you out there too. Cody Ritchie, uh, this is from the wine and mead making enthusiast, uh, mead making or mead mead and wine grape, uh, uh, mead and wine make. Um, says uh, he decided to start making his first batch of mead. Uh, gonna let it ferment dry and then, uh, back sweeten it. Says he's gonna post what he, what he used and he did that. Uh, looks like three pounds of raw, unfiltered, unprocessed wildflower honey. Two pounds of Dutch gold orange blossom honey. One teaspoon of yeast energizer. Two teaspoons of yeast nutrients. Uh, Looks like uh, about uh, one and three quarter gallon of Deer Spring, uh, Deer Park spring water. Uh, five teaspoons of acid blend. Boy, I want to caution you there. Uh, the pH uh, came out to 4.4 to 4.6 after acid blend. Uh, yeast used was 71B. Uh, rehydrated at 102 degrees. Pitched at 74. Outgoing gravity was 1.090. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure what he's asking. I guess he just wants to get everybody's opinion on, uh, on what to expect out of that. So again, it's, uh, it's about five pounds of honey, uh, in a, about a gallon and three quarters of water. That seems like an awful lot of honey for a 1.090. Uh, outgoing gravity. Uh, but anyway, I know, uh, well, I know Jeff can see the notes, but uh, <laughs> what do you guys think? Hmm, well, I was going to say starting like, gravity. The starting gravity was 1.090. And again, that's with five pounds of honey and 1.75 gallons of water. That seems awfully, awfully low gravity or, well, high gravity or whatever you want to call it. Well, go ahead, Jeff. I was going to say that's, that's, uh, 1.75 gallons of water and a pretty good, uh, quantity of honey, at least a little over a quart. So and we're talking about a two gallon batch as opposed to a one gallon batch, I think. Um, so I could see it, you know, at 2.5 pounds per gallon getting as low as 1090. I would think it'd be a little bit higher, but I don't know the, the quality of the honey he's using either. It could be, you know, a, a, a watery or thicker honey that's affecting that. Um, as far as the, the recipe itself goes, you know, I thought it was pretty sound until I got to that, uh, that acid blend. Um, and man, I, I hope the, uh, the spring water is like a really calcified or really buffered one, kind of like the, the water around here. Um, cause he, he may end up regretting that, uh, that quantity of acid blend up front. Um, really, if I'm going to use acid blend, I use that on the back end and I use it as sparingly as possible because that can just lead to trouble with pH crashes and, uh, stalls and this, that and the other. Yeah. Let JD tell you all about acid, uh, acid blend and, <laughs> uh, yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's the one thing that kind of jumped right out at me when I saw this recipe, uh, on the, on the Facebook page here was that, that was that five teaspoons of it. Uh, that's a, that's a really a lot. 
uh, a lot of recipes. Yeah, he wanted to, Go ahead. Yeah, he wanted to know what, what to expect. Uh, you can expect it's going to be bone dry, for one, and it's probably going to be tart, <laughs> really tart. Yeah, uh, and he says he's going to back sweeten it. Uh, his intent is to let it go dry and then back sweeten it. That, I don't know. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the method. All I, I don't know why the reasoning behind that. I if I if I knew that I was going to back sweeten it, I think I would have started out with a little bit more honey and maybe raised the gravity up a little bit and maybe not let it go bone dry. But he's using 71B, and we know Chris that that comes down at least 104 to 106 points, right? Uh, yeah, I usually uh, usually will count on a hundred and six point drop uh, with seventy one B. I'm not a big fan of back sweetening either, so um, yeah. you know well, that's that's to each his own. Though it's, it's not a wrong or right way to do it; it's just what you prefer. Yeah. Well, in uh, Jeff, the sweetness, uh, it, the sweetness may offset that tartness just a little bit if he's going to back sweet. We don't know how much he's going to use as far as back sweetening, but I'm wondering, you know, uh, even if he does, uh, is, it, is it going to be enough to overcome that tartness out of that five teaspoons of acid blend? Yeah, and you've got to be a little bit careful with trying to sweeten up a tart mead. Um, you can you can really easily get um, the, the sweet tart effect. Um, where it's really tart and really sweet, and it just tastes like candy. It's uh, it, it's not an enjoyable mead, and it's if you're gonna back sweeten it, man, uh, just go a little at a time and kind of dial that in very carefully because it's easy, easy, easy to overdo it with the sweetness when you've got a very tart mead or a very dry mead for that matter. Um, you, you may not realize you've gone too far until you've gone way too far, and it's a lot easier to to add a little bit more than it is to try and subtract at that point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Once it's in there, yeah. it's not coming back out. Yeah, and another thing to, to keep in mind from here on out, uh, I don't care whose recipe you're reading uh, or what you think ahead of time. Remember, acid blend, tannin, uh, all that kind of stuff, those are meant for adjustments, and they should be done after the fact. So ferment your your beverage, wait for it to clear, uh, and when it becomes drinkable so that you can actually assess the flavor, then make the determination about whether you need this stuff or not. Yeah. So that may be a uh, – and I'm wondering if this isn't uh, one of those Internet recipes that he may have found because virtually all of them include some level of acid blend. Uh, and uh, and uh, that may even be a, a, a holdover or a pull down from the winemaking, uh, home winemaking too, because most of the home recipes for wine, for sugar wines and these country wines include some level of acid uh and uh and I think what they've done just you know have taken and adapted some of these home wine making recipes into mead making just replaced the sugar with the honey and left the rest of them alone many of them say and just use a wine yeast uh but uh Cody I hope uh you know I mean we gave you our honest opinion about it um uh, I hope that, uh, uh, you know, takes you somewhere with it. And uh, we all kind of agree that the uh, acid blend may have been uh, may have been the one thing that might uh, set you back here. But, again, based on what you're going to do in the end with the back sweetening, who knows? Uh, you know, it may come out all right. And I'll tell you what, uh, if you want if you want a, a, a real uh, if you want a better opinion on it, send us a bottle after it's done. And uh, we'll be glad to taste it for you right here on the air for you. Um, tonight, uh, we got a couple of new things that we want to talk about. But uh, before we get into uh, too much of it, we need to cut Chris loose. Uh, and uh, he's going to be doing a project live here on the air. Let's start out with that first, Chris. 
uh, let's run them through the cherry mead recipe. And uh, what do we need for that? Okay, we're going to do a basic a tart cherry melomel. Uh, we're going to use one quart, a 32-ounce container of fruit fast tart cherry concentrate. Uh, you need to have about three or four gallons of spring water on hand. Um, it's going to take somewhere between uh, 10 and 12 pounds of honey, probably depending on the sugar content of your honey. Um, and we, and said, we're gonna use, uh, we said wildflower or orange blossom honey, either one, right? Either one, yeah, either one will work. I'm going to be using a wildflower tonight. Uh, but the orange blossom also works good. Uh, by the way, this is for a three-gallon batch, so we're going to ferment this in a five-gallon food-grade plastic bucket with a lid and uh, that's been drilled for an airlock. And um, we're going to need the 71B yeast. At least a uh, uh, five-gram packet will work. Uh, some go firm to rehydrate that with. And we're going to need your basic meat making stuff like a hydrometer, a drill mounted stir, lee stir, or a slotted spoon with a long handle. We're going to need some sanitizer. And uh, I, I put in on the recipe a pectic enzyme. That's really optional. I'm honestly, I'm not sure how much pectin that, that cherries contain, but I almost always use pectic enzyme uh, whenever I use fruit. So uh, if you don't have it, it's not the end of the world. It'll eventually clear on its own anyway. Uh, but if you do have it, we're going to use that. And uh, I think that's about it. I will say this. I wanted to do this live for a couple of reasons. Um Number one, sometimes this fruit concentrate that you buy will have slightly different gravities in the bottle. So we need to, we need to dilute that to a consistent gravity before we add any honey. Um, the second reason is we talk about all these different aspects of making mead, but when you're sitting around talking, it's different than when you're actually doing it. So I think sometimes when you're when you're doing it hands-on, maybe we'll discover some things we haven't discussed before that yeah. people may have questions about. So, and that um, that cherry, uh, the cherry juice, the uh, concentrated uh, cherry juice is actually coming from, I believe it's BrownwoodAcres.com. Is that right? I believe that's correct. Uh, you can get it there, or. Most of your Kroger stores carry it. Uh, there's a cooler section over in the produce uh, department, and it will be over there with some of the other, uh, like the healthy fruit juices and things like that that are refrigerated. Well, let me ask so you. If you have a Kroger nearby, you, can, you might be able to find it there. If you can't get the, if you can't get the concentrate, uh, not easy to find like out here where I live. However, I could go to Trader Joe's. Their brand of uh, – they have a, a tart cherry, an organic tart cherry juice, uh, which is mm -hmm. not a concentrate. It's made from concentrate. Would that work? Would that be the same thing? Uh, well, most of those juices like that, I know there's a brand, uh, brand called R.W. Nudson uh, that makes good ones called Just Tart Cherry. Uh, most of those are made from Montmorency uh, cherries. Uh, this particular concentrate that I'm using is made from, uh, I think it's like 99% Morello cherries, and it's got just a little bit of Montmorency in it, like just 1% or so. Yeah. Um, so there's a difference in the in the body and the acidity. Uh, and sort of the, I guess you might say, the richness of cherry flavor. Uh, I think the Morellos definitely have an edge over the Montmorency. Um, and, and anyone with Internet access can order it from uh, brownwoodacres.com. But let's just say you don't want to do that if you want to go to your local store and pick up some, some just tart cherry juice. Uh, yeah, that'll be fine, just as long as you... Uh, 
we get about the same uh, volume and um, dilute it down to about the same gravity that we're going to do this, uh, it'll work. And you can make a pretty good cherry melomel from, from Montmorency cherries. Yeah. So we put, so I'll, I'll try to cover that if I can. When we when we dilute this concentrate, I'll try to do the, the quick calculation and tell you about what you would need. Yeah. If you use the juice. Okay. And you're gonna you're gonna stay with the Fermaid K nutrient. Uh, any particular? Uh, you, you use kind of a modified Tosna uh, schedule, right? I do. Uh, I generally use the Tosna protocol. Uh, I use their schedule and I use the Tosna uh, table to figure out how many parts per million I need. But I convert that to Fermate K rather than Fermate O. Um, and the reason I do that is because I work with higher gravity musts. And uh, so if I'm, I'm working with a lower starting gravity, I'll usually do Tosna as it is written with the Fermate O. Uh, but I think with these higher gravity muffs like we're going to make tonight, uh, I think there is some benefit to having some of that uh, diammonium phosphate in there, even though it's a very small amount. It helps to get yeast started off. Um, so when you're when you're figuring the difference in those, or if you're deciding to use Fermate K, uh, in the Tosna uh, calculation, where you would normally divide by 50 parts per million, with Fermate K, you would divide by 100. So um, uh, that's the only difference in that. But we'll, we'll get to that later on as we when we get to that stage. Okay. So we won't other... be adding any nutrient tonight anyway. Right. Uh, some of the other... Uh pieces of equipment that you might need uh, are things like a thermometer. You'll need a clean glass dish to rehydrate your yeast in when we do get around to that. And then a, a turkey baste or some kind of a wine thief that uh, you can fill your your hydrometer jar with uh, when, we get, when we get to that point, too. Uh, you know, and, and, and typically, uh, you know, when I'm doing it here at home, all of my fermenters, I have, I have open access to so i just kind of drop the hydrometer right down into the fermenter itself i don't even fill a i rarely fill a jar anymore uh the only time i do that is after it goes into a secondary but uh um so that's uh that's the the rundown of the equipment and the recipe uh the recipe is posted on the website uh if you uh, can't uh, work along with us tonight you're more than welcome to uh cut and paste it uh, into a Word doc or whatever, and uh, it's right there on the front page of themeadhouse.com uh, that you can work along, along with us. Um, are you set to go, Chris? Are you all sanitized up and uh, ready to do your thing? Well, actually, yeah. I'm starting from absolute scratch tonight, so I'm going to uh, – right now I'm about to mix up my sanitizer – I've got a little two-gallon bucket extra that I'm going to mix up some star sand in, and uh, so I'll be doing that now. Um, quick word of caution. This is something, one of those things I've always forgot to mention. Uh, if you're using star sand, uh, it is an acid-based uh, sanitizer, and almost all fermentation buckets have some rubber on them somewhere, either the gasket in the lid, the gasket around the airlock, um, or somewhere there's going to be a piece of rubber. Uh, you want to be very careful using star sand on rubber, or otherwise you will end up with a sulfur rotten egg smell because it starts to break down the rubber. And uh, if it gets in your mead, you can kiss it goodbye because you cannot get it out. So go easy on it. Uh, don't don't make it up stronger than you normally would. Uh, and it's actually, if you've got rubber on your fermenter or anywhere, or gaskets or whatever, it's probably better if you use some other kind of sanitizer uh, on those parts anyway. Good point. Good point. Yeah. All right, so while uh, while Chris is mixing up the sanitizer and uh, getting ready to sanitize all his equipment, uh, let's turn it over to uh, uh, to Jeff. Jeff, uh, you just recently had your mead tasting 
a little get together over the weekend, and you were working on some yeast nutrient uh, experiments. Uh, and I think uh, you, you know, and, and you know, when we started this show, that was the one thing that drew me to you. I wanted you to be on this show uh, because it sounded like you you knew what you were doing. Uh, I was very uh, I was very enthused by that one post I saw on that Facebook, and I was very eager to find out what what the result is going to be. Right. Uh, so here we are, I don't know how many months uh, later, well, 12 shows later, I know that, uh, and you've had your, your little get-together. You've tasted all of the different experiments. What was the outcome? Well, we, we got some interesting results, and, uh, well, where to start? So um, I had about 12 friends over, and they're all, um, most all were relatively naive to to me, they've, they've had a little bit, they've enjoyed it. Um, they've all had something I've made probably, um, but maybe not a lot of experience with it. Um, one of them was a home brewer, um, like me and, uh, has made some meats of his own. So, um, he's a, maybe a little bit more informed, but, um, overall it was a pretty good, good gathering of people. Um, they, everybody got uh, about two ounces per Sample, uh, not everybody finished two ounces, but everybody got two ounces. Um, and the overall favorite was my condition four, which was the, uh, it was actually the reverse of, uh, the Travis Blount Elliott's, um, version, which uses Fermate O and Fermate K and DAP in different times in different amounts. Um, so this one, the way it worked is we started with a pretty, heavy dose of Fermaid K and DAP at 24 hours, then a second dose at 48 hours. Uh, and then the 72 hour and one third sugar break doses, we switched to, um, a, a dose of Fermaid O, which just contained less, um, less yeast available nutrient or nitrogen. I'm sorry. Yeast available nitrogen. Um, a very close second to that result was actually my control, um, which was, not even staggered. Uh, it was like measured by volume. I think it was, you know, maybe a teaspoon and a half of this, that, or the other, and just pitched right at the same time I pitched the yeast. Uh, I degassed it like the other ones for consistency, but otherwise, um, there was nothing added to it after that point. Um, and I think the reason I got that result is actually, uh, has, has nothing to do with the flavors or anything else related to it. I think it was the residual sugar. Um, because, a a good uh, staggered nutrient addition um, really just encourages the yeast to just keep going. And um, some of those came out bone dry, wow. which was contrary to, I think, um, a lot of people's expectations of what a a, a uh, honey-based beverage should taste like. And this um, is a uh, – this was taken – you started out with a five-gallon – basic traditional meat that you had split off into five containers, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, started in gravity of 1120. I pitched the yeast directly into the five gallon before I split it off, so uh, the yeast amount was consistent. It was really well mixed before I split it off. Um, and it, it basically, I tried to control for any potential little hiccups there that um, could, you know, could weight things one way or the other outside of the difference in the, the nutrient additions. Yeah. Um, so those were the two that fared the best for my friends. But I'm mean, honestly, I'm going to ignore those results a little bit um, because I think residual sweetness was the key factor there. I don't think it played much of anything into the other flavors that came out of it or the, the actual, like, uh, the character of the mead. Uh, I think it was, it was mainly... Um, decided by the amount of sweetness and uh to quote my wife the uh the one that won her tasted like uh charcoal lighter fluid it was just apparently bad um now she's she's tried a lot of my needs and she's a little bit more aware of it my friends to their credit said all of them were pretty good and they would happily drink any of them if i would only just have them over again um but to my way of thinking, Travis Blount 
Elliott's uh, version, the one that starts with a little, little bit of Fermate O for the first two editions, and switches to Dap and Fermate K, Case the best. Um, and I've, I've lost all my notes as far as all of the different gravity readings, um, so I, I can't tell you much other than it was the second lowest uh, final gravity of any of the batches. Um, hmm. It had just a little bit of acid, and it had a, a really nice, clean taste. Um, just a really, really good, solid ferment go through that. Um, so I enjoyed it immensely, and I think for uh, for my purposes, um, even though it was not the one I was expecting to, to do the best, uh, that's the one I'm going to go with um, moving forward. Um, the... Uh, the toast note was actually an interesting one to me, though. Um, it was actually the least liked out of anybody. Um, it was my second choice. Um, and I think the, uh, the the reason it was the least liked has to do, again, with sweetness versus dryness, because the toast note seemed to encourage far and away the most complete fermentation. Um, the final gravity there was something like 99.6. It was low. Um, it didn't have a lot of body and character to it like the other one that I liked did. Um, so that, that lost some points there. Um, but the caveat here is that if you're not making a traditional and you've got other stuff going on, um, maybe a lighter, cleaner ferment is what you're going for. So you can showcase those flavors a little bit better. Um, so yeah, there's, that's the long and short of how the experiment came out. Um, of course, there are some caveats I'm going to mention here. This is, you know, these are one trial of each, and so we can't really draw like final conclusions from this. We really need to get that repeated again and again and again. Um, you know, the the whole uh, sweetness versus dryness thing is um, is a potential foil here, and so it, it makes me think that I need to repeat this experiment with a higher starting gravity, uh, maybe something like 1150 so that there's always a little bit of residual sweetness. Uh, my fear there is it's just going to be dialing in sweetness level that people like and not, you know, the, the other flavors that I'm really looking for. It's um, kind of so like, I not- uh, you, know, you know, what you're saying almost reminds me, it's almost like handing a crowd, handing half of a crowd a Milky Way and the other, the other half a carrot stick and asking them, you know, which do they prefer, you know? Right. Uh, yeah, I, I can see where this is going. I mean, had the people ever had me before that you had over to try to uh, try this stuff out? I think almost everyone has had some mead, um, okay. and almost everyone has had at least one batch or another of mead that I've made. Um, so the, they weren't completely naive to it, but I think there is an expectation inborn with uh, with this crowd that mead is going to be sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a couple of thoughts, you know, maybe the an alternate approach could be instead of aiming for a higher starting gravity where you would have all varying levels of residual sweetness. And like you're saying, Jeff, you might be measuring people's fondness of, of sweetness or dryness. Start with a lower starting gravity so that they all come out bone dry. And, and that might be an interesting way to, to kind of see what different flavors you get, you know, with, with that type of approach. Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts about that? That is actually an interesting idea. Um, and, you know, this is one of the things I love about experimentation is that we can, we can get some preliminary results like this or some, some tentative results like this and go, you know, we should test this and that and this and this and this. Yeah. And exactly. it's a wonderful thing where experiments beget more experiments. Um, I, I'm jazzed about about that. Um, and yeah, no, overall I was very pleased with, with how things came out and, uh, we got to try some of my other, um, my other concoctions here that were a little less experimental. Um, and yeah, just really, really well received. So I was very, very happy and it kind of felt like the, um, you know, I, I, I put a lot of effort into making meads for the last few years and, uh, trying to, to hone and refine my craft. So it was nice to get some Really solid appreciation from some very tipsy friends. I'm I'm kind of bummed. I'm kind of bummed. I thought uh, here I thought Jeff was going to lead me down the path of righteous meat making. With this experiment. 
<laughs> now, I, you know, uh, I, I'm glad. Uh, I'm very glad you did that. Um, you know, staying on a show. I mean, just making mead stuff as uh, uh, we listen to Chris uh, sanitizing his equipment. I might have to have Chris mute his uh, mute his mic. But hey, uh, Jeff, uh, and JD, um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I got all my sanitizer mixed up now, and uh, so <clears throat> in the two gallon bucket, I've got my hydrometer. Um, I've got an airlock. I've got a little glass dish that I'm going to rehydrate my yeast in. I've got my stir, the, my drill-mounted stir in there. And I've got a little spray bottle here that I use to help sanitize my fermenter. And I've got it full of sanitizer. So everybody can go ahead and sanitize the lid and, and your fermenter. I'm going to do that now, and I'll be back with you in a moment. Sounds good. Uh, Chris, uh, Mississippi Chris putting together a here for us live on the show. Uh, went through the recipe again. You can copy the recipe off the website. It's on the first post of the page up there. Uh, if you go there tonight, the meathouse.com. Um, so Jeff, there's really uh, no real, uh, no real definite outcome that would lead uh, anybody down one path or the other quite yet? Uh, sounds like more well, experimentation or? The answer is always more experimentation. Um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, we can always refine our craft a little bit better and zero things in a little bit more. Um, I got the definite result that I wanted. I think the, uh, the way that I'm going to, um, approach my nutrient additions from here on out is going to be the Travis Bomb Elliott example. And, um, for the, the listeners at home, um, as far as setting all these nutrient regimens up, I just used the, the batch builder utility on the mead maker website. Um, really simple, really easy to use. Uh, you just kind of, you input some sliders in your figures and it tells you exactly how many grams of each to use at each time. Um, so, and it gives you actually three approaches. It'll give you Fermate K and DAP. It'll give you the Toast Snow with Fermate O and it will give you this one too. Um, so couldn't be easier to, to figure up. You don't have to bust out your calculator and do anything complicated that way. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the approach I'm going to take moving forward. Now I'm probably after I do some, uh, some more fun stuff with fruit and things like that, that I have planned for this summer. Um, I'm probably going to do a follow up and I may refine my technique a little bit and, uh, switch to, to Tosna or something else. Uh, based on those experiments. But for now, I think I'm going to go with this one. And that's really what I was hoping to gain out of the experiment. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I was hoping for whatever result that you, uh, you know, you would come up with that would help the rest of us, uh, you know, in, in the nutrient feeding, uh, part of making meat anyway. So I'm, I'm glad you did it. Uh, you know, I welcome the result. Uh, now if I could ask you a favor, can you write it up? And let's get it posted up on the website. Sure, uh, absolutely. And uh, people can see the results. And, uh, you know, feel free to choose your own method for sure. Uh, but Jeff went through the uh, the trouble of doing this as, this experiment. I'm kind of eager to try the method that you, uh, you know, you, you found uh, that you'd like to go with. Uh, I'd like to try it out for myself and, and just see what kind of results it produces here. Yeah, um, I mean – Try and compare is a great way to um, for people at home to, to do this too. I mean, I got really good results from from Tosna and from um, from this method um, to my way of thinking. So, uh, if people want to just do those two trials rather than all five like I did, you, know, yeah. you may find your own personal preferences are uh, are working there too. Um, well, the other thing too is, you know, Jeff, there, there's not a lot, and I, I've been, I have been all over the internet. Uh, I mean, if you know me, uh, you're gonna know that I have sat here for hours and hours and hours all over the place looking at mead, and there is just not a lot of this kind of data out there when it comes to making mead at home. There just, there just isn't. Uh, no, much, much of what is a hit or a miss. It's people's best guess. It's whatever worked for them. Mm -hmm. But can 
mead making conditions is everything because we're going to be talking about temperatures here uh, in a little bit. Since uh, you know, some I, I don't know about where you live, but where I live, summer's here. It's, so yeah. So you know, it's it's uh, uh, it, it's through experiments like this that you're doing that helps the rest of the community out. Uh, mm -hmm. I, absolutely, the the lack of this kind of experimentation and this kind of data available to the public uh, was one of the things that finally pushed me to say, you know, why hasn't anybody done this yet? I'm yeah. going to do this. Um, and I, I really hope that it inspires people to, you know, try their own experimentations with this stuff and try and, you know, repeat my experiment. See if you get different results. I welcome different results because we're, you know, we're getting different conditions and we're getting, you know, more uh, trials in here that really backs up or refutes the data and makes a finer point for the community as a whole. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, and Chris, you know, Chris has made it a point a couple of times to say that, you know, what, what you find on the shelf from these, you know, professional meteries, it all started from home. So we're, we're actually the people who are making all this stuff happen. It's the things that we do at home, uh, because, I mean, you're looking at the, the, the future of this industry. All these guys, uh, Sergio and Fairbrother, all these guys, they started making meat at home, uh, you know, and it, it probably went from a spare room to the garage to a basement to, you know, now the house is too small, we've got to go rent a space. Uh, and then, you know, the, the metery is born. I mean, professional meteries haven't been around that long. So, you know, the things we do it here, here at home and the stuff that we come up with certainly have an impact on the industry itself, uh, you know, down the line. So, and that's the cool thing about it, I think. No, it's for, for a, uh, an industry or an art form that is waking back up, there's still, a lot to be done with it. I mean, we uh, we have a lot of ground to cover, I think, and it's exciting to be a, kind of at the forefront of that. Yeah. Um, woof, woof. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> Let's, uh, you know, we, we, we've been talking, uh, last week I think it was Mellow Mel's and, uh, and what was the other one? The other That's one. Methylgins, yep. Yeah, we, we, we talked fruit and spice last week. I thought this week we'd spend a little bit of time uh, talking about a couple of other mead styles out there, Bochets and Braggots, neither of which that I have ever done. And I have to, uh, I have to say, and I, I can't remember if I talked about this on the last show, but I, I, I did manage to finally... Uh, do up some caramelized honey the proper way. I did it. I, I've got a small uh, pressure cooker. Now, mind you, it was a little bit less than a half a pint that I did, but uh, the results were the same, and I was actually rather pleased this time. Uh, hey, uh, hey, J.D., before yeah. you get into that and I interrupt your uh, train of thought, let me uh, bring everybody up to speed. Okay, I got my five-gallon fermenter uh, sanitized with star sand, drained out the excess, and so now we're ready to add the concentrate, the cherry concentrate. And this is a 32, I think it is, yeah, 32-ounce fruit fast, 100% red tart cherry juice concentrate. And it's made with uh, Morello tart cherries and a little bit of Montmorency tart cherries. Uh, this 32 ounce is supposed to make two gallons. We're going to make more than that with it because we need to get the gravity down and we need to reduce some of the acidity by dilution. So what I want you to do now is go ahead and uh, shake up. Shake up. Did we lose Chris? Take your mic, take take your mic off mute, Chris. <laughs> uh, we may have lost Chris. He's still online with us, but uh, I'm sure he'll pop back. Oh no! Just when it was getting exciting, too. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Chris is uh, Mississippi Chris. Uh, he, he's down there in Mississippi. He's working on uh, this cherry mead for us here tonight, uh, putting this recipe together, taking us through step by step. I know that he's using this 32 ounce uh, of of uh, uh, tart cherry concentrate that he got from Brownwood Far uh, Brownwood Acres uh, dot com, uh, and uh, he's going to shake that jar up and mix it into his fermenter along with the water. I presume at this point, I don't know whether he's added the honey yet or not. But uh, Chris, are you still there, bud? Well, let's Can anyone hear me? Yep, we got you, Chris. Go ahead. There he is. J.D., can you hear me? Yep, yes, I can. Okay. Sorry, I, I've got a bad connection, I guess. That's all right. You're um, with us. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Pour the uh, 32 ounces of concentrate into the five-gallon bucket that you're going to ferment in, and then I want you to take two gallons of spring water... And uh, I want you to pour some of that water into the, the container, shake it up, and get all that concentrate out. And so this step, you'll have the 32 ounces of concentrate, and you will have two gallons of spring water in your fermenter. And go ahead and mix that up really well. Okay. And I'll be back with you after I do that. All right, and we have not added any honey yet. So all we've done is put uh, the two gallons of water in along with the concentrate, rinsed out the bottle of concentrate, uh, tossed that in, uh, so that we've got uh, two gallons of liquid in our fermenter. And Chris will be back with us uh, here shortly again. But uh, back to this uh, caramelized honey, guys, I, I, I was quite quite pleased. Uh, the first batch that I had done, uh, as you know, was really bad. Uh, and I think uh, the reason being is because the pan that I did it in was just the wrong one. Uh, I, I didn't want to use my big fry pan because I didn't want to do that much. The batch that I managed to come up with, uh, now I know that you two have done caramelized honey. Okay, so here, here's what I here's my taste. Here, here's what I got. I got this almost a a marshmallow like flavor out of it. Um, just a very 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 slight bitter, uh, and and I think that probably comes from the cooking part. Uh, the aroma. Uh, I, I mean, I got, I got this caramel aroma. It smelled like caramel. Um, but I was more enthused about the flavor. I, I really enjoyed that, that roasty. I mean, I was almost, it just, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, I mean, it was like a roasted marshmallow over a campfire. Um, uh, so that's basically what I, what I found. Interesting. So, Am I am I on the right track here? Is that what I I'm should have expected? Good boche. Yeah. 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 I, I caramelized my first honey, my first experience with it, just this past Friday as well. Um, I used Jeff's method of of using a crock pot, and I caramelized two pounds of of a wildflower honey. And just the way you're describing the finished product is is very similar to what I got from mine as well. You know, I, I definitely got the, the roasty, almost smoky flavor as well. And, and one of the words you used definitely made my ears perk up when you said there was a little bit of bitterness. Um, I got a little bit of like a dark chocolate flavor from mine, which, which I thought yeah. was kind of interesting. So, um, the, the caramel flavor and, and aroma, definitely that's coming through. If you can imagine like a honey flavored caramel. Yeah, right, right, yeah. yeah. So, hey, JD? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Uh, I should probably mention that sometime in this uh, these concentrate bottles, you'll get some sediment in the bottom that's kind of like really hard stuff. Right. Uh, go ahead and, and fill that up with water, shake it till it loosens up, and make sure that goes in your fermenter because that's good stuff. You want all that. Good deal. Um, all right, so uh, Boucher's. But there's one thing about caramelized honey 
that I don't know a whole lot about and that I've only heard. And I know I've heard Chris mention it a couple of times. Uh, and maybe, Jeff, uh, since this is Aaron's and mine's first attempt at doing this, maybe you know more. There, uh, There's only so much fermentable sugar in that caramelized honey now, isn't there? Because there's some that's going to remain unfermented. You've, you've fundamentally changed the way some of those sugars are formed, and that is going to prevent the yeast from being able to metabolize those. Um, that said, you probably haven't done it very much. Um, in, in my experience, it does about, it affects about 10% of the honey that way. Um, your, your experience may vary. And I think the, um, the, the methodologies change that as well. Um, probably, um, burning it in a, like over a campfire or in a pan, uh, on the stove, um, will yield a different result than the low and slow approach that, uh, we're trying to take with either using a pressure cooker or a crock pot. Um, so yeah, there, there is some unfermentable sugars now. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, I want to say it. I'm not certain whether or not those unfermentable sugars um, still carry the perception of sweetness, though. Um, that that may just be a uh, something that will contribute sweetness that you can't get rid of uh, at this point. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, the obvious question here is going to be, well, how much unfermentable sugar is going to be left? How is that going to the level of sweetness in the mead, uh, if any? <laughs> You know, and I, I think at the end of the day, um, what you're going to find is that uh, you may get a little bit of sweetness in the meat. <laughs> Chris, so Chris, you're making a lot of racket there, bud. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way. I can't mute Chris either. Uh, he's, he, um, it almost sounds like a drill. Uh, but go ahead, Jeff. Well, yeah, you're, oh, you might really have sure. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. No, that was my drill. I'm sorry. I should have muted my phone. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> hey, you know what? Uh, we might be technically challenged, but we put on a hell of a show. Uh, uh-huh. Go ahead. The hazards of doing this live, right? <laughs> That's true. <Yeah. laughs> hey, the, you know, this ain't Radio City Music Hall, so what the hell? Uh <laughs> All right, back back to the back to the boche and, and this caramelized honey. I, I guess the question that I that I would be asking is, you know, when I when I'm putting a recipe together and I want to use uh, I don't know, say you know, five pounds of, of caramelized honey, uh, you know, in my mead, should I be looking at I mean, you know, and how do I how do I treat the hydrometer at this point? Um, boy, this opens up a whole big quandary, doesn't it? It really does. There is a whole big can of worms here, and I will tell you that I've I've not done a lot of pochets. I've done this. I mean, technically, the uh, the coffee that I'm putting together now will be the third I've done using a caramelized honey. Um, that being said, um. I assume it's going to turn out a little bit sweeter um, than it would otherwise, but not a lot. And I just basically treat my honey quantity the same um, with a willingness to add a little bit more later if necessary. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it sounds, uh, you know, it almost sounds like another experiment uh, getting ready to take place here, at least (laughs) in my household. Um you know, just exactly how much does, uh, say, three pounds of caramelized honey, uh, you know, what does that yield uh, as far as sweetness goes uh, on a side-by-side with uncaramelized and caramelized, I guess. But mm-hmm. um, There you go. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, you know, here we go again. I mean, and this is what the cool thing is, uh, you know, about making meat at home is this experimental aspect. I mean, you know, uh, the all night long, the, uh, what's this other one? Tempted to touch from Melovino. The other one I got sitting here, sweet, to- uh, sweet sorrow. All this stuff started out as an experiment somewhere along the line for, for Sergio. So this is what it's all about. And, uh, you know, this Boche, uh, uh it, it, the Boche's, um, 
they're not something. Uh, it's, this is not new because I've seen several old videos on YouTube, uh, several years old. In fact, I saw the one. I guess the most popular one, Aaron, is the the one with the guy doing it over an open campfire. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like he's got a big vat of tar, almost. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yep, yeah. I know the one you're talking about. Yeah. So uh, you know, I'm I'm curious now. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the the curious level is getting to me now because now now I want to know what this is going to taste like. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think well, I'd rather, I'm, rather than do a, uh, you know, add fruit or spices or anything to it, I, I think I would just caramelize a batch of honey and, and do a traditional or whatever you call it. Boche, I guess they call it now. Huh? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one of the things I'm I'm interested to see with our coffee boche that that Jeff and I are doing. I, I'm curious to see because we've introduced kind of the as we've described roasty, smoky, dark chocolate, marshmallow type flavors that that we're going to be getting with with the caramelized honey. But then we also used some raw honey, but then of course the the cold filtered coffee as well. So. Um, some of the, the flavors that, that I was picking up in the, the caramelized honey are a little coffee like even. So it'll just be interesting to see how those flavors pair with each other. And, and like we've said, you know, JD, I, I'd be interested now just to do a plain old boche where it's just 100% caramelized honey to really be able to hone in on what that flavor is. Yeah. Because these other, you know, the raw honey and the coffee that, that we used in this coffee boche, we might not be able to just segregate out just that that caramelized honey flavor. It's in there, but it's yeah. in there with a couple other things going on, too. Well, let's talk mm, about – oh, go ahead, uh, Jeff. Yeah, I, I think they are definitely going to play really nicely together. Um, at least I'm getting that perception from, from my own experiment, too. And – uh uh, yeah, I'm. I don't know that we'll necessarily be able to pull out what is the the uh, the boche and what is the coffee going on, um, but I'm I'm really liking this direction so far. I yeah. am too. I was going to ask what what you thought of just the the must flavor if if you sampled any of that yet. You know, um, I sampled a little bit because I, I I always do, but I've had so much. Of the the Melavino since then that it's kind of um, <laughs> kind of washed away in the palate. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's been put at the back of my my mind. I mean, I uh, I also had the big uh, the taste testing this weekend that like I actually drank very little of this testing. I, I kind of uh, I stuck to mostly water and was running around sampling and talking to people, or sorry, filling up samples and talking to people. Uh, you were the host, <laughs> right? Uh, but I was busy. <laughs> And, yeah. you know, that, uh, but it wound up like I, I got out of there and went, wow, I'm beat. <laughs> my, uh, my years ago, my dad used to be the general manager of Carnation Company at the ice cream plant in, in here in Glendale, California. And chocolate ice cream, uh, in, in the, in the industry, in the business, it's commonly referred to as rerun. Because what they do is they strawberry and vanilla, the leftover uh, ice cream mix, okay, and they throw it back into now the chocolate batch because chocolate covers up the flavors of strawberry and vanilla very easily. Coffee does the same thing. Coffee will cover the flavor of so many things, Uh you know, and I can see, I can see where you know maybe you didn't make such a great traditional to start with. Add some cold brew to it; you might be surprised how good it tastes after that. So. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I um, hey, you know, go ahead, Chris. Can I pop in? You betcha, Chris. Working on the okay. cherry beet project here. Go ahead, Chris. Okay, so I've got. The uh, 32 ounce concentrate in the bucket, along with two gallons of spring water. Yeah. And so that gives us a total a volume in the bucket of two and a quarter gallons. 
Okay. Uh, I took I mixed that up really well, and I took a gravity reading, and I had a gravity of uh, 1.044. It's a little bit difficult to get a, an accurate gravity because there's so much foam from the mixing, but it looks like about 1044. Um, what I want to do is uh, start to dilute that down. So I'm going to go ahead and add uh, six cups of water. Uh, excuse me. I'm going to add eight cups of water, which will be another half gallon. And I'm going to mix that up and check the gravity again and see what I have. I'm going to be aiming somewhere around uh, 1020 for a starting gravity on the juice alone. So um, check your gravity and see where you're at. You should be around uh, 1044. And start adding water. I would I would suggest a half a gallon to start with. So I'm gonna I'm gonna add a half a gallon more water and mix it up, check the gravity, and I'll be back with you. Okay. At this point, we have not added the honey yet. So uh, Chris putting together the cherry mead at home live here on the Mead House tonight. Kind of fun listening to him. You know, he's taking us all the way through the sanitizing process. Uh, all the equipment, anything that is going to touch anything that goes inside your fermenter needs to be sanitized. We want to caution uh, everybody who listens to the show on that. Um, and if you come to my house, you'll see I, I kind of go overboard because it's not only that. It's the floor, the countertops, the walls. Anyway, um, so the bouchets, uh, there's a couple of different methods of 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 making this caramelized honey that we want to spend just a few minutes on. One, of course, is that uh, pressure cooker method that, uh, that I use. Uh, if you, if you do, and, and I've done so much caramelized sugar in the past, it's not even funny. That can be a very dangerous, uh, a, a very dangerous thing if you don't know what you're doing and don't ever walk away from it. Not it's not like a pressure cooker where you can, you know, kick it up a notch, wait for it to start steaming, adjust your 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 fire, and just let it steam. You cannot leave a pot full of of uh, you know caramelizing sugar alone. Do not leave it alone. Uh, and you you should be wearing uh, at least some long sleeve shirt. Uh, I highly recommend that uh, because it's possible for it to splash every once in a while when it gets to boiling really hard. And that stuff is like napalm. It will burn right through your skin. <laughs> um, and when it starts to turn color, it happens very quickly. Um, the other thing about doing it in a pressure cooker, guys, that I found I had to stop at once and check the water level because I know this from canning, uh, you know, uh, like meat sauces and vegetables. Uh, you know, you have to cover the container. Uh, there has to be enough water in your pressure cooker to cover the container, the jar. And if you don't put enough, you don't, if you don't have a good inch or more of head space over the top of the lid of the can, uh, you're going to have to stop it, add more water, start it up again. And I had to do that once, um, only because it was a small pressure cooker. But I cooked it for 80 minutes, and it came out almost a molasses color. Uh, and it almost that was the other flavor that I was trying to put together, too, that almost uh, not quite a – you know, it's not like the uh, – Blackstrap molasses that you commonly get uh, in the baking section of the store, but all, almost that flavor uh, was another flavor that I detected. But that's, those are two methods that I'm familiar with. Now, you two have done it in a crock pot, right? Correct. And how, yeah, how did have. that work? How, how, explain, explain how you did that. Well, for me, I, so I did this on Friday of last week and um, actually was working at home that day. So I think it was about 8.30 in the morning. I, I put the two pounds of honey in the crock pot. Um, I remember Jeff had, had talked a little bit about this last week and, and said, you know, at the low temperature on the crock pot, it, it can take a long time. 
And I definitely found that in my experience as well. Um, I, I was a little hesitant to just kick it up to high right out of the, the gate because I, I wanted to try to stick to this low and slow. But after about three hours simmering on that low temperature, I had hardly any, any color change. Um, so, so at that point in time, I, I turned it up to high and, and also took his advice of removing the, the top, um, so, so that, you know, you, you'd get a little bit more like evaporation and, and hopefully a little bit more color change that way. Um, I actually then met my wife for lunch, so unplugged it and, and, uh, left for maybe an hour and a half or so. And, and then when I came back, it had kind of reached that nice dark color, um, that, that I was going for. So I, actually I, I snuck a picture up on the, the Meat House Facebook page. If anyone's interested to see what kind of that color progression looks like, um, one of the, the things I've noticed, go ahead. How much time was that again? Um, so I think all in all, it must have been, Six hours in the crock pot, uh, like a long time, three, three and a half hours on low, then another hour on high uncovered. So that puts us at four and a half hours. And then, then I turned it off and left for another hour and a half before I came back. Now, granted the last hour and a half, the, the heat was off. Yeah. So Can I break in a sec. Yep. Go ahead, Chris. Okay. Uh, I added a half gallon more of water so we've got a total of uh two and a half gallons of spring water plus the one quart of concentrate and i'm looking at a gravity right now in the juice of about 10 30. uh there's a lot of foam from the mixing so it's difficult to see right down to the number but it looks like it's about 10 30. and uh so i tasted it and that's about what we're going to go with so if you're down uh, between 10, 20, 10, 30 on your juice, that's pretty good. Um, I'd, I'd probably leave it around 10, 30 to start if you uh, if you haven't already diluted past that. But 10, 20 will be okay also. Okay. So um, so now what we want to do is uh, go ahead and start rehydrating the yeast. Uh, I'm using a five gram packet of uh, Lauben 71B. Uh, if you have an eight gram packet, that's fine. Go ahead and use the whole thing. Um, you'll need 10 grams of GoFirm if you use the eight gram packet. Uh, with the five gram, I'm going to use 125 milliliters of water and I'm going to put that in the microwave, get it up to about 110 degrees, maybe a little warmer. And I'm going to add in six. 0.25 grams of go firm into that water and stir it until it's completely dissolved. So that's okay. what I'll be doing now. All right. And uh, just a recap here just a little bit. This is a cherry mead recipe that we're putting together live on the air here with Chris. Uh, he has so far mixed a 32-ounce container of tart cherry concentrate that he got from Brownwood Acres. Dot com. Uh, you can order it there, uh, and along with uh, roughly about two and a half gallons of water. Now, he started out with two gallons of water, and he's adjusted the water up after mixing the concentrate up to a gravity of 1.030. That's where he wants to start uh, before you add the honey. So we've got roughly 10 to 12 pounds, give or take, of honey that's going to be coming. This, again, is the importance about using a hydrometer um, rather than just arbitrarily dumping poundage in. It's okay to guesstimate your poundage, but really uh, do your final addition using the hydrometer. You'll get a much, much better outcome. And uh, we'll let Chris talk about that uh, a little bit more when he comes back. But uh, back to the caramelizing, guys, you both did it in the uh, in the crock pot. Uh, Jeff, uh, how was yours? How, how did yours come out? 
Well, you know, I'm I'm a little bit more of an old hand at this crockpot caramelization business. Um, so I I cranked it right up to high. Um, I didn't even bother. <laughs> um, lesson learned. Lesson learned. <laughs> yep, you tried yep, to tell I, me. You, know, you tried to tell me. <laughs> um, and I I put the lid on it for a little while, and I noticed there was a lot of condensation, or not necessarily condensation, but you know, a lot of water vapor can coalescing into into water um, along the top rim of that lid, and it was draining back into the, the the honey. And I figured I wasn't doing myself any favors keeping the honey wet uh, when part of the the whole point of this is getting rid of some of that water content. So I took the lid off after about two hours. Um, and I got to, to where I wanted to be. I want to say about an hour and a half, two hours after that. So we're talking about four hours total cook time. Um, you know, I, I pretty much set this up in my kitchen on, uh, um, on a Saturday afternoon when I was, you know, in, uh, anticipation of this big, uh, meat experiment. I knew I had to bottle, uh, about five gallons worth of stuff. So, Broke out a bunch of bottles. I cleaned those up while I was doing this, and then uh, started making some uh, some breakfast burritos to have you know some breakfast I can uh, freeze and eat during the week, and uh, just kept myself busy while I was doing this. Kept an eye on it the whole time, and it didn't bubble up. It got to the temperature, or sorry, the color that I wanted. Um, and I didn't take it quite as dark as I have in the past, but it was still kind of like um, uh, that that uh, um, that really dark oil bronze finish you see on. Um, metal, uh, where it's very nearly black, but it's, it's more of a dark brown. Um, when it cooled a little bit, it got to, uh, a really thick caramely consistency. So I, I kind of felt like that was right on the money. Cool. Very good. All right. So, uh, caramelizing honey, we've talked about several different methods from, uh, doing it in a pan to a pressure cooker to, uh, a crock pot. Um, you know, and again, I mean, this is, uh, this is something that I think I want to do. I just want to do some honey, uh, do some, uh, caramelized honey up, uh, throw it in a fermenter, uh, and, uh, you know, just run it with some, I'll probably use Sony 1B just for, uh, giggles and, and see where it winds up, uh, Aaron. So, uh, I don't know. You and I both are kind of in this, in this together. Let's say we do one, uh, together. Yeah, I would definitely be down for that. I um, just a gallon, you know, just a gallon of uh, of uh, mead. It uh, it may be a little while for me. My uh, carboys are at capacity right now, but <laughs> okay. um, sign sign me up though for the future for sure. No problem. Um, let's talk a minute about braggots. Uh, now I don't know anything about braggots other than it. Uh, it is the use of hops and grains or just hops? Actually, just grains. Just grains. Okay. Mm-hmm. Just, it just does grains. not necessarily require hops, but often if you're trying to copy a beer style, you'll want to use the same or similar hops too. Um, but it's the important part is that your fermentable sugars are coming from malted grains. Okay. So is it safe to say that you could get some, say, malt extract and throw in with it? Or Absolutely. The the easiest way to make a braggot, um, for, for those of you at home that want to try this, is just go to your local homebrew store. They have either the liquid malt extract or the dry malt extract. Um, get yourself a couple pounds of that. Um, add that to, to your honey. Um, uh, now, obviously, like I was talking about with uh, the – um, mellow mills. If you've got more, um, more of your significant gravity coming from the, the malt than you do from the honey, you're making a honey flavored beer. You're not making a braggot. <laughs> um, but as long as you're adding a, a good amount of braggot to where you can, I'm sorry, a good amount of malt where you can taste that grain, um, you are making a braggot and it's, it's that easy. Um, wow. you can make this as complicated or as simple as you want from there. Okay. You know, I mean, it's almost like it's almost like making beer. I, I thought, you know, b- before I got into meat, I thought it was beer that I wanted to do. I, that's where I started this whole years ago. And I thought, boy, making beer, this is going to be really a complicated process. Because, like, you know, you, you see all this equipment that people have, all these mash tons and all these different things, you know. And yet... <laughs> 
when it boils down to it, I mean, if you can boil water on the stove, you can make beer. <laughs> I mean, that's how simple it is. If you can make oatmeal in a pot at home, you can make beer. Believe me. So this braggot sounds like it's the same deal. I mean, you know, uh, if you can make, if you can throw, you know, mashed up blueberries into a fermenter, you can surely, by God, throw what a half a pound or a pound of, of malt extract in with some honey. Sure. So, mm-hmm. uh, gosh, how simple. So, what what kind of flavors are we expecting out of? Well, I'm not and, sure how that would go with honey. And here's the thing. Um, this is, you know, the, the braggot is a wide open field that, um, and the great thing about braggots too is that commercial mead makers and commercial beer makers have a really hard time making it. Um, because often, uh, alcohol walls are set up so that a, a meadery is more like a winery. And a, a brewery is more like a brewery, and never the twain shall meet. Um, I was talking to, to somebody with ambitions of setting up his own meadery a few weeks ago, and he informed me that in my state, if you're going to do braggots, or if you're going to have beer and wine in the same facility, you basically have to have a tape line down your floor, and anything beer-related goes on one side of that line, and anything mead or wine-related goes on the other side. Yeah. Wow. So, um, this is one of those areas where, you know, the home mead maker with very few, uh, very few like government regulations to follow, uh, is it totally an advantage to have an open playing field and just go wild? Yeah, you know, and, you know, I, and without getting into all that, I mean, if you want to learn more about that stuff, you can listen to the Got Mead Live show. I recall, you know, getting involved. I mean, there is a huge pile of legal crap that, you know, most of, most people have to go through to, to even start a meadery. And then it's, you know, uh, you know, if you, if you make beer, you're a brewery, you can't make wine. Well, if you, and if you're a winery, you can't make beer because you're a winery. And it's just, I don't know. There's a whole. So yeah, I think you're right, Jeff. I, I, and this, you know, this goes back to the comment I made before. It starts right here at home. Okay, we're we're we're, we're the ones laying the foundation. You know, uh, you know. I, I mean, uh, we get involved in making these braggots, come up with a, a method, a recipe, or whatever that a meadery can make without crossing that line. Uh, this is where it starts. Well, and the the perfect example here is um, I've talked about this on the show a couple of times. I have a a braggot that I made using porter grains and this boche style of like caramelizing honey that came out just dark as the day is long. Um, it's a little bit sweet. It's got some of that like almost a Guinness like um, quality to it. It's got some of that toasted uh, toasted honey flavor to it. Um, it's really dark. It's earthy. It's complex and I let some of my friends try that this weekend after we were done with the taste testing, and I kind of had to preface this like, okay, this is different from any meat you've ever had before, because it is. Um, mm-hmm. they, they've never tried something like this. I can almost guarantee it. Uh, but it came out pretty fantastic, and I've I've been kind of just sitting on it and letting it age and letting it age and trying it every once in a while, and it just keeps getting better. Yep, yeah, I'm telling you, my mind is racing Right now, I mean, if you could see, if you could see inside my brain, you know, <laughs> I, I love a good coffee stout. So does my wife. And if I could make a mead, okay, using the Boche method of caramelizing honey, together with the Braggot method, using a good, a nice, you know, malted extract uh, with some coffee. And come up with something Ooh. similar to Stone's uh, Velvet Merlin. Oh my hmm. god! You know, well, I mean, my, I like my, that my, idea. Yeah, my, my, my brain's just running away with, you know. And really, the the porter part of this was just a touch more complicated than uh, um, than what you just outlined. I mean, realistically. 
uh, a big part of the fermentable sugars that went into this were just a dry malt extract that got added in with it. Actually, it might have been a wet or a, um, a liquid malt extract, but that's beside the point. Um, there's there was an extra component that came from, and you're going to laugh. I actually uh, did a cold soak or a cold brew on some dark grains. Um, I left them in a big pot full of cold water on my stove for about 24 hours. And all of the, the dark grains that you get that porter color from uh, just drained out into this beautiful, like, blackish morass that became part of the must. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, unlike hey, JD? Your, uh, Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Okay. Uh, let me get everybody up to speed what I'm doing here. Um, I got the water to 110 degrees, uh, 125 milliliters of water for for a five gram packet of yeast. I added in six point two five grams of GoFirm and I stirred it. It takes quite a bit of stirring to get all the clumps to dissolve. Yeah. So by the time um I got everything dissolved and mixed in, the temperature was down to a hundred and two point two. So that's close enough to a hundred and four is ideal. Um if you if you have any doubts about the accuracy of your thermometer, it's probably better to go a little bit lower to avoid damaging your yeast anyway. Yeah. So 102 degrees for me, and uh, so I just sprinkled the uh, 71B yeast on top. I don't stir it. I don't do anything else to it. Just sprinkle it on top, put it back in the microwave, close the door. It's a draft-free, dark place. Yep. So that's the yeast is rehydrating, and so now what I'm going to do is add um, uh, one and a half teaspoons of pectic enzyme, and I'm going to start adding honey and using my mixer uh, to dissolve it. Uh, I think a good safe place to start would be uh, let's add nine pounds of honey and get that dissolved, and then we'll check the gravity, and we'll start sneaking up on it because our final gravity, uh, this is going to shock some people who've never done this before, but our starting gravity is going to be 1.154. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1.154. 11.54. That's going to be our starting gravity on this. Um, and uh, so, and seventy one B has no problem whatsoever starting at one point one five four, right? Not when it's rehydrated properly. No, it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, now let me say this also: um, we diluted the cherry juice in order to help reduce some of the the uh, acidity. Now, some of that acidity is going to come back during fermentation, and it's going to present itself a little bit differently than it will in the fresh juice. Um, on the other hand, 71B is going to uh, metabolize some of the malic acid, and malic acid is the predominant fruit acid in cherries. So the 71B acts to soften it to some degree, uh, but some of the other acids are going to come to the forefront, and that's going to help balance the sweetness. Yeah. Since we like, since we diluted it some to help um, uh, soften that even further, you can get by with starting uh, a little bit lower gravity if you run out of honey. So if you've only got nine or ten pounds, and let's say you only manage to get up to a starting gravity of one point one, uh, well, let's say you're ten points low. Let's say you end up at at one point one four four instead of 1.154. Well, you should be okay with this particular recipe in that that regard because we've diluted the juice. Um, But if you can get up around 1150 to 1154, go ahead and and do that. Now, that's what I'm going to shoot for, and um, I'm going to go as far as this uh, honey will take me, and I'll I'll get back with you on what my particular uh, final gravity is. Okay. Now, you know, again, a reminder, Chris is going to add about nine pounds or so of honey in there. And then from there out, he's going to add using the hydrometer to get up to the 1.154. Uh, 
So uh, this is how important or, it is to have a hydrometer. Or wherever this amount of honey takes me until I run out. So I may not. Yeah. Uh, I may not actually make it all the way up to 1.154 uh, with the amount of honey that I have, but uh, I'll let you know where I end up with, with what I have. So uh, I'm, I think I may end up a little bit lower than that with this, but that'll be okay, like I said, because we diluted the juice. Yeah. All right, very good. Uh, and Chris will be back here uh, in a little bit and uh, let us know where he wound up with. Uh, with the honey addition, um, back to this, uh, back to these, uh, this braggart uh, idea is, uh, it's not necessary to, to boil your honey and malt extract like beer making at this point, right? You just, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. You just incorporate the honey into your water, uh, along with the malt, be it dry or liquid. Mixing it up well, like you would uh, any other meat, correct? Well, the approach I usually take with it, um, the couple of times I've done a braggart related beer was to, uh, essentially boil the, the, the malt extract, um, with or without hops, um, according to your recipe, like you were doing a beer. Um, and then after you get, uh, the, the malt extract cooled down. Um, at that point, you add the honey to it and start incorporating the two together. Okay. All right, so it's much like beer making then. Um, My process has been. I'm sure there are other ways to do it. Yeah. All right. Yeah, for, for the braggot that I've done, that's similar to what I'll do as well. I think uh, my recipe calls for, I think it's a 30-minute boil um, and then either a half ounce or, or a full ounce of nugget hops as well. Okay. So you're, you're making a beer like mead then, right? I mean, is this is what, it, uh, is this, this is what I'm hearing then. If, if, uh, you know, talking about hops, I mean, uh, talking about malt extracts and, and all this, is this, the, the flavor profile that we're that we're looking for. I've never had one, so I have no idea what to even expect. I would describe it as as beer like, but it's also mead like. It's hard to describe. It's definitely a, a complex flavor that you get. Um, I I really like it. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of its own own flavor and. Uh, in, in the braggot that I've done, um, you know, it, it's been more just a, I don't even know if there, it's any particular style of beer that, um, that it's made from. Um, I'm just kind of reviewing the, the ingredients right now. You know, it calls for nine pounds of wildflower honey, six pounds of a Pilsen malt syrup, Again, the either half ounce or full ounce of nugget hops um, as well. But what, what's interesting to me and, and some more experimentation that, that I'd like to do is just kind of mimicking different styles of beer with your braggots, you know, like like what Jeff has done with, with a porter style. Um, I am a big fan of, you know, like black IPAs or, or real dark roasty malt profiles counterbalanced with with real high levels of, of hops um, so that's been a style that that I've been wanting to do but but that's what's interesting to me is you know just as many styles of beer as you can think of you could mimic that with a braggot yeah interesting uh, on my list uh, I'm, I'm sitting here writing notes as, as we're talking. Uh, you know, because like I said, I, I really like a, a, a very nice coffee stout in a beer. And, uh, to be able to put something similar like that together, uh, in a mead, uh, with, uh, just a little tiny bit of sweetness in there with it would be amazing. Uh, and, uh, that's definitely going on my experiment list, uh, which is growing. Thanks to you guys. So, well, the feeling uh, is mutual. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Well, you know, being retired just occupies uh, not all of my time, but uh, a good part of my time, along with my winemaking uh, that I recently got into. And uh, we'll soon be getting into some beer making here, probably in the next couple of months. Um, I definitely need to try that out uh, as well. But, you know, guys, uh, summer is here where I live. I mean, in Southern California, we have winter, which uh, usually lasts for, for several months. And then we have spring that usually lasts for, oh, maybe six, seven hours. And then we have summer. And uh, it's summer here in Southern California, although a few mild temperatures here in the last week or so with some clouds. But uh, it's going to be in the 90s uh, come the weekend. And it'll stay there for uh, the next uh, couple of months, probably. The problem that I initially had in starting out this little hobby was controlling my temperature. And I know we've talked about it on an earlier show, a much earlier show, actually. Uh, you know, uh, being able to control temperatures and uh, doing it on on the cheap, on on the down low, on the uh, you know lesser expensive side. I mean, you can spend literally thousands of dollars and get one of these. Um, oh God, the thing just went right off the top of my head. What's glycol that? chillers. Yes, glycol chiller. Uh, or you can spend several hundred dollars and go the refrigeration route. Chris, I know, uses a small apartment-sized refrigerator, and you can pick them up brand new for 130 bucks. Digital controller added in. Uh, you're probably looking at 150, 160 bucks by the time you get done. But even lesser than that, uh, staying with the digital controller, uh, all it takes is some copper tubing, a submersible pump, a Coleman cooler, and a digital controller called an STC 1000. Now, all of this is outlined on the previous posts that I made. And I'll gladly uh, uh, repost it and put it back up there. But uh, it's very simple. Uh, without going into the whole full, you know, instructional video type uh, deal here, you're basically filling the Coleman cooler full of block ice. Don't use uh, crushed or uh, adding a little, just enough water to bring the level over the top of the submersible pump pickup. And then running your uh, your uh, feed line and your return line from the copper tubing that's wound around your carboy, okay, if you're fermenting in a glass carboy. And uh, uh, basically all you're doing is pumping chilled water uh, through that copper coil, which is going to retain that cold for, for quite a while. It'll also help draw heat out of the glass carboy. And you'll be surprised at uh, how well this actually works. The cool thing about it is that you can couple it up to this digital controller and actually control it within several degrees, actually one degree. Actually, you can get closer than that. You can get within a half a degree uh, of temperature. Uh, that's how precise it is. And, uh, you know, the parts uh, are easily found. You know, virtually all everything can be found on Amazon.com, uh, your local hardware store. Uh, and it's just a matter of drilling holes in your Coleman cooler to feed the, the plastic tubing through so that the cooler obviously remains sealed. Uh, and running it over to your, you know, you, you want to hose clamp all your fittings. Uh, to avoid any kind of leaks. But it's going to take about 60 to 80 feet of copper tubing. That'll be your biggest expense right there. Uh, hey, J.D.? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Hey, uh, once you get your uh, get some honey mixed into the must, go ahead and take out um, about three or four tablespoons of that and start to slowly mix it in with your... Um, with your yeast water, it doesn't matter if you haven't reached your final gravity uh, or your starting gravity yet. 
Uh, as long as you've got some honey mixed in, that'll provide some sugar for the yeast, and we can start bringing those temperatures together. So go ahead and uh, let's see, uh, let's go with about four tablespoons of must slowly mixed into your yeast. Yeah, and what he's doing there. And, and it looks like uh, right now uh, I've got almost all of my honey mixed in. It looks like my starting gravity is going to be, uh, looks like I'm going to end up somewhere around 1.142, I think. That's about as far as my honey is going to take me, and that's absolutely fine. One. If we had more acidity in this, we would want to start higher. But uh, it looks like I'm going to be about 1.142 when I get this mixed in. But I'll I'll be back with you in just a few minutes. Let's right. start tempering the yeast, though. Yeah, what he's doing by adding that uh, that must to the yeast, he's actually acclimating the le the yeast to the temperature of the must. What you don't want to do is pitch your yeast when it's more than 10 degrees. Uh, uh, apart in temperature, so uh, be very careful about that. Uh, you'll wind up, uh, you know, killing a bunch of yeast uh, by doing that. But getting back to this cooling thing, uh, you know, it just takes a little bit of ingenuity, uh, uh, you know, to be able to put a system like that together with very few dollars. Now, another system that, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, an adaptation, actually this is one that Chris came up with, you can you can take it a step further. Chris uh, uh, has this idea of taking uh, a a larger container uh, and fitting a like a seven point nine or six point nine gallon or seven point nine gallon fermentation bucket, a regular fermenting bucket uh, inside of it, and then taking your copper coil. And winding it around uh, inside the big bucket, or you know, winding it around the, the small bucket so it fits down inside the big bucket, and then fill the big bucket full of water. So now you've got this water sleeve uh, with the copper coil fitting into it, and uh, then you want to circulate your cold water through through it using the same submersible pump and and uh, and cooler set up uh, along with the digital controller this time you you, you can stick your uh, thermal couple into the water or I do it by using a thermal couple uh, that you can get at your brew store uh, that'll go down into your into your bucket now you may have to drill another hole in the lid uh, in order to make it work but uh, at least you'll have a method of controlling your fermentation temperature. And again, you'll be very surprised at how accurate a temperature you can maintain for an extended period of time. Uh, and depending upon the ambient temperature inside your house or your fermentation area, guys, uh, you may wind up having to fill your Coleman cooler you know, from 24 hours to, uh, you know, like me, I'm almost, uh, I can go almost 42, 44 hours uh, without changing ice uh, in mine. And I'm actually looking to extend that because I'm going to invest in a really expensive Yeti cooler uh, and get it even further down. I mean, I'm looking at probably 56 to 60 hours uh of, uh, you know, without having to change up at that point. So, but just a couple of methods. Now, there's an even simpler method that you can use, and that's the water bath method, just simply, you know, a small fan, uh, a towel, and a container full of water. And you wet the towel, drape it over so that most of it hangs down into, or some of it hangs down into the water of your bucket, and then uh, acts much like a wick. You put a small fan uh, blowing gently against it, and that will also cool down uh, your fermenters as well. So uh, a couple of ideas as far as keeping your temperature. And fermentation temperatures are really, really important. Uh, I think most of the problems that people have uh, have to do with temperature control. 
And uh, if you can get that down pat, uh, you should be making some pretty good meat at home. What do you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then I like the sounds of these, you know, DIY do it yourself types of, of projects. Um, uh, every time you bring this up, I, I'm taking notes as well. You know, I, I am fortunate at least this time of the year to live in, in a region of the country where, um, you know, even though it's the middle of June, I'm down in, in the basement right now and, and it's a cool 65 degrees. So, so pretty, um, favorable fermentation conditions down here, but, um, you know, in, in other regions of the country where, where that's not the case, I mean, you've got to do something to get the temperatures under control. Cause, cause like you're saying, JD, that is probably the, the number one factor that people can, um, you know, adjust to, to improve their mead making. Yeah. You know, the other, uh, I've got one of my stainless steel fermenters, uh, which actually has a some, uh, it's an immersion chiller that comes with the unit uh, that fits down inside. It, it's also controlled, I mean, you're talking same principle here, you're cooling the must, uh, but it's even more precise than my other system because I have this, uh, this heater, uh, that is taped on to the stainless steel, the exterior uh, part of the stainless steel fermenter, and it's the it's made of a mylar material with the uh, wire windings going back and forth. Actually, it's copper, uh, just flat copper going back and forth, and it's something similar to a heating pad type element. Uh, uh, neoprene insulator that, that stretches over the outside of the fermenter goes over the top of that. That's plugged into my STC uh, 1000 digital controller. So the temperature is extremely precise. Uh, if it just gets a hint above the set temperature uh, and it needs to heat, it'll start that heating element up uh, and warm it up. Uh, if it gets uh, above a certain temperature, obviously the chiller pump will turn on uh, and uh, will cool it down. And this is all controlled by a thermocouple that goes down inside a thermal well uh, that keeps an accurate reading. So, uh, and I've had, I, I can sit here and watch it, and I can see when the heater starts up just for a few seconds, turns off, uh, on occasion, and same thing with the chiller pump, uh, and it just keeps that must just perfectly uh, at, at a at a solid temperature. So uh, these are things to think about, you know, uh, when you're when you're making uh, when you're making mead. Absolutely. And you know, the nice thing about it, like I say, is it, it's not terribly expensive because I, I consider this. You know, you're gonna, the, the biggest expense that you're going to have is buying honey. Uh, and if you're gonna invest that kind of money into, say, a five gallon batch, or like Chris is doing, a three gallon batch of mead, uh, then why not spend a few extra bucks and do it right? You know, uh, be able to avoid some of the shortcomings of doing this, uh, and, and problems that, that you, you know, would face without it. So that's, that's the way I look yeah. at it. Absolutely. And like you said, this is not an expensive thing to do. I mean, I'm in the process of kind of gutting a, uh, an old refrigerator that I got to, to wire it up to an STC 1000 myself. And, um, this is another approach you can take to it. You can get refrigerators or chest freezers or any kind of, uh, Cooling equipment pretty cheap on Craigslist. Just verify that it works at least you know, decently well. Um, an STC 1000 costs about um, sixteen, seventeen dollars on Amazon. Yeah. Um, you get some get some wire, um, a little project box to put it in if you want to th- keep things nice and neat, and you're in business. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I say, the the nice thing about that ST one STC 1000. Is uh, did you get the dual relay? Yeah, 
Yeah, it, you can control heat with it and cooling, uh, which makes it a, a, a pretty unique. I, I don't know that you'll need it with uh, your refrigeration, but that's easy too because all you have to do is put a porcelain, just fit a porcelain uh, uh, light fixture inside and put a light bulb in it. And mm -hmm. you can, just that simple light bulb is enough to raise the temperature inside that refrigerator uh, to keep your temps pretty precise. So, uh, you know, I, I know Chris uses a, uh, a, uh, a an apartment size uh, refrigerator. And Chris, are you there? Yep, yeah, I'm uh, just about to get back with you here. And I heard what you said, and I will not be doing that with this cherry because I got the coffee in it. Okay. So... Lucky enough to have an air conditioning vent right in front of where I do my mead. So we're going to be going old school with this, and we're going to do an old swamp cooler. Uh, now, well, that's a this method. This is another one of those. That, that's a method one those, we talked about that works, you know. Uh, yeah. So absolutely. This Go is ahead. one of those things I told you that uh, sort of pops up when you're doing things that you never think about otherwise. Yeah. And uh, so one of the questions that I think people might have is, when do I take it down to fermentation temperature? Because we're going to be starting out here right about 72 degrees with, with our must and, and everything. We want to ferment this thing down around 60 Sixty-two to sixty-four degrees, if we can get it that low. Yeah. And um, so, when do you do that? Well, you don't do it right off the bat. You let this uh, let the yeast get started and kick off. So, normally, when I make meat, I do it about this time of night. And uh, so, I'll let this sit at room temperature until in the morning, and then I'll start dropping the temperature. Um. That gives the yeast time to get started with a little bit warmer temps. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's what we'll do. We'll let this sit at room temperature tonight. And then in the morning, what I'll do is I'll set this into um, a shallow pan with some water and wrap an old T-shirt around the bucket. And with the fan and the air conditioning vent blowing on it, well, that will... Uh, that'll drop at a good ten degrees, easily. Yeah. yeah. So we'll be able to we'll be able to keep this uh, in the sixty-two to sixty-four degree range. Uh, by the way, I just got finished. I, I only had um, twelve pounds of honey, and let me see. Gosh, there's so much foam. Um. Looks like I'm going to be starting at about. 11.38 is about the best I'm going to be able to do with this. So I've got another pound of orange blossom sitting back. So I'm going to go ahead and put in that other pound of orange blossom. If you don't have it, don't sweat it. We only told you to get 10 to 12 pounds. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, the acidity on this is not terribly bad, so we don't have to end up as sweet as we normally would if we didn't dilute it. And I did that on purpose because I know that some people don't like really tart things. Uh, normally, I wouldn't dilute this juice. I would buy two containers and use uh, about one and a half of them to make uh, three gallons. But mm -hmm. we're making this for the masses, so it's less tart. Yeah. So, therefore, it needs to be less sweet in the end to balance. So, I'm at 11.38 right now. I'm going to add uh, whatever honey I can scrape up around the house here, about another pound or maybe pound and a half. And whatever that is is what it'll be. So, there you go. we're going to keep an eye on the temperature of the yeast. And when we get within 10 degrees of the yeast and the must, um, I'm going to aerate the must really well. Going to pour the yeast in, airlock it, and that's going to be it for tonight. You won't have to do anything else until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. There you go. <laughs> that sounds good. So, uh, again, this is the Cherry Mead Recipe Project. Chris putting it together live on the show here tonight. 
And uh, uh, again, briefly, uh, what we've done is we've mixed 32 ounces of cherry concentrate that we picked up from brownwoodacres.com. Uh, order it from them. It's a concentrate, uh, 32 ounce jar. You add that to two gallons of water. Uh, Chris buffered it up, uh, with another half a gallon before he added roughly 12 pounds of yeast. Uh, if you get to a gravity after adding your yeast and you're somewhere between 1.138 to 1.154, which was the initial target, you're going to be perfectly fine. Uh, the yeast has been rehydrated. Uh, we're just waiting it to, to come to temperature. And then uh, Chris will pitch it in, and uh, you're basically done for the night. Uh, throw the lid on it. Uh, I'm not going to touch it until the morning. Um, and the recipe is on the website. Uh, and I'll, I'll get with Chris tomorrow and uh, find out if there's anything more that he did to it or what other steps uh, that might have been taken. We'll be sure to get it up on the web page, uh, uh, you know, for some extra notes uh, along with it as well. JD? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. JD, that, uh, once we pitch the yeast and, and airlock it, that's going to cover it for tonight. Yeah. Um, for the next seven days, you're going to aerate and degas or degas twice daily. Um, since we're pitching at 12, I mean, at, at 10 o'clock, uh, my time, uh, I'm going to do it at 10 a.m. and, and 10 p.m. That'll be my, uh, lead maintenance times, I guess, so to speak. Right. So we'll give it, we'll give it its first feeding of nutrients tomorrow night at 10 o'clock. Uh, the second feeding, 10 o'clock the next night, 10 o'clock the next night will be the third one. And then uh, we'll start checking the gravity, and, and you will find the one-third sugar break is when you do the fourth and final. And uh, just as a matter of note, I'm going to be using three grams of Fermaid K per feeding. Three grams. Okay. Perfect. Three grams per feeding. Very good. Three grams of Fermaid K per feeding. So. Yep. And there will be four feedings, so that will be a total of 12 grams altogether. Um, and the first feeding will occur at, at this time tomorrow night. There you go. <laughs> Good deal. Well, uh, you know, that's that's perfect timing because we're about two hours into the show. Uh, that's the longest we've ever gone. Uh, and uh, not that we don't have fun doing it, but uh, we're sure glad uh, those of you who were able to listen live uh, were along for the ride. Uh, Next time you get me and try to shuffle a phone around without getting uh, sticky honey all over your phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, you know, this is going to be a really good batch because uh, you've heard of the bee's knees. Well, I actually got bee's knees in this. There was some bee parts in the honey. Yep. Uh, they went right in, and I think there's a fruit fly in there as well. So, well, I, good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a little I, yeah, talking about getting honey all over the place. I I had about maybe. Oh, not even a third of a bucket of honey left, and I wanted to get it out of the bucket in the quart jar. So I set the bucket in the in the bathtub with the hot water for about an hour, and uh, managed to get it into the quart jars. But I probably got a couple of pints all over the kitchen floor before I was done. Uh, so that was a uh, on my hands and knees scrubbing the kitchen floor before the wife woke up uh, <laughs> projects. So, yeah, been there and done that, Chris, uh, with honey all over the place. Um, hey, if you came along for the ride tonight, we're glad you did. Uh, we will be back. I, I don't even know when our next break is. How many shows have we done so far since uh, we came back? Uh, we usually try six on two off type of thing so we get a little bit of a break so